afternoon and thank you for being here. And let me introduce now the panel on innovation in storage technologies and demand response economics. So this panel will be moderated by Sarah Bell, a CEO of Tempus Energy. And we are also very pleased to welcome uh, for this panel Chris Kimetz, Commercial Manager of Open Energy. Nick Masson, CEO of, COO of Energy Deck. Philippe erzen Menzel, spokesman of Unicos. And Joab Zinger, CEO of Kiwi Power. But before we start the discussion, I will invite uh, each panelist to briefly introduce their company. We can start with Tempest Energy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting us here today. We're all very pleased to be here to come and talk to you about uh, how each of our business uh, approaches the changes that are happening in the energy markets. Um, so Tempest Energy is an electricity supplier um, as of yesterday. So uh, very fresh news. <laughs> it's very exciting for us. It's a, a change in our direction. We've previously been a technology company. So uh, we're now starting out uh, as being a supplier using our technology. Um, we use demand response technology, which some of the other panelists will talk to you a little bit about um, in a minute, but we use it as a supplier uh, to optimize the total energy bill. So if you imagine, for example, um, if you're going on a car journey, uh, you can choose to accelerate and brake, accelerate and brake um, as you go through that journey. But as we all know, that uses more fuel. What Temps Energy does for the uh, energy sector is effectively smooth out some of those uh, peaks and troughs by helping customers to move to lower price periods. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the value and the cost in energy comes around how you manage the risks. And fundamentally, uh, Temps Energy is coming in as a, uh, a different approach to risk management in the energy sector. Um, when, when you start getting renewable generation in the grid mix, you start to change the risks, and the risks of being out of balance grow. Uh, but the real reason why this is a problem is because we're still using a very blunt instrument, cash, to manage those risks after the fact. Renewable power is used as a scapegoat for these rising costs, but actually <laughs> uh, it's because we're not managing the imbalance risk. Um, so what this means, and to, it's always tricky when you come to a conference like this to really know exactly what the knowledge level is. And um, obviously here on the panel, we spend a lot of time in this industry, and so we end up knowing it very well. Uh, but essentially, just to explain this, uh, as an electricity supplier, you don't know what your customers are going to be using in any given period. So you make your best guess, but you're wrong every time if you operate on the, uh, the business model that the rest of the supply market does. So let's say uh, you bought at a price of, um, say, 50 pounds a megawatt hour. You bought a particular amount, but your customers use double. The, the extra 50% more, you have to pay for at a different price. And that is effectively the imbalance risk. Uh, so at Tempest Energy, we use dynamic demand response in those real-time traded periods to hold to a position we've already pre-bought on, and therefore we avoid this risk. And this is technologically possible now through innovative technology of both demand response, telecommunications, uh, sensors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by using demand response technology much more holistically through the energy system, we as customers, whether we're business customers or individuals, we can benefit through lower energy cost. And this talks a little bit about how that happens. But innovation requires markets, real markets, to come, to come alive. And that requires competition. So, sorry, I'm just going to go back there for a second. Um, in the UK, we don't have a competitive energy market. Uh, we have a market where 90% of generation is owned by six entities. Um, they also have supply businesses. As soon as you, as a generation business, own a supply business in your wider group, it's very, very hard to focus on making it, it as cheap as possible for customers. You have to focus on selling the generation at the highest cost, at the highest price. But if you are approaching this from a customer perspective, 
you would want to buy it at the lowest price. And if you own both, those, both the assets of generation and you have a supply business focused on customers, it is impossible to do both. Does everyone see that? Is there anyone who, who doesn't understand that concept? I'm seeing some blank faces, which is not good. <laughs> Go ahead. You, sorry, you, okay. <laughs> so, as a, um, a generator, I want to sell my generation, right? I want to sell it at the highest possible price. The highest price is at times of peak demand, when everyone uh, wants to use it. Quite simple economic theory. Um, but as a customer, I obviously want to buy it at the lowest possible price. So if I own a generating asset, it's very hard for me to focus on the customer's needs, which is low-cost energy, because actually I'm focusing on my revenue. And this is a fundamental market failure uh, that 10% uh, energy is really coming into the market to, uh, to try and solve for the benefit of energy customers. Uh, so what we'd like to change is we'd like to get open trading for electricity for over any deals over one megawatt. Uh, we want to get them, and I think when we have this panel discussion, we'll talk a bit more about the capacity market, but we want to get a level playing field for the capacity market. We want to get real consumption data for customers, and we want to get the electricity price paid to reflect the true value of that action in the system. So in the current system, those who want to can optimise for customers, but there are still some regulatory barriers in there. Uh, there are the technologies available now. These companies are developing and have developed those technologies. But what we need is competition in the market to make all this innovation flourish. Thank you. I think it's me next, but I'll just... It's not me. This slides. Nobody. Uh. Woohoo! They appeared without me trying. There's clearly someone in the back doing this. Excellent. Pretend the start of this presentation wasn't that. Hello, I'm Chris from Open Energy. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about um, demand side response. Uh, that's what we do as a company. So I'll give you just a very, very brief context of what that is and how it works. So fundamentally, in the olden days, you would to generate power, you would go and you would dig a whole load of coal, and you would burn a whole load of coal, and you would turn that coal into steam, and you'd turn that coal into electricity, and then the lights would turn on. Very nice. If more people turn lights on, you go and you dig more coal, you burn more coal, you make more steam, you make more electricity, and then the lights stay on. And that's all very good. So back in the day, generation is done on the supply side, and that's a sensible thing to do. In the future, we're going to need to have a bit more of a dynamic energy system. Uh, and we're trying to do this on the demand side. So first of all, this is a grossly simplified view, but the energy system is changing quite dramatically. So on the left-hand side, we're not just burning coal and gas, but there's some intermittent renewables that are on the system. That provides more of a challenge to balance the system. And then on the right-hand side, you've got distributed generation, as well as some demand response and some storage, which we'll also hear from today. So we have a more complex energy system. It's a more difficult thing to balance. You cannot just pour electricity into a lake like you can water or pour it into a big barrel like you can do with gas. Supply and demand have to meet each other at every single second of every single day. And I actually quite like Sarah's analogy of if you're doing this on supply side, it's like hitting the accelerator and the brake, the accelerator and the brake. And that's just a waste of coal, it's a waste of gas, and there's a smarter way to do it. So that's where demand response comes in. So we work with National Grid to help balance that supply and uh, demand uh, intersection. Specifically, we have very, very fast acting demand response, so we actually look at the frequency on the grid and we try and track that. What does that mean in practice, or what does that look like in practice? So this is example number one of a thing what we do. So Hurricane Bertha came along on a Sunday night. It blew. There was lots and lots of wind energy. There was a sudden spike of wind energy of 200 megawatts. That's what you can see at the top. The grid frequency starts to rise because there's too much power on the grid. Open Energy's response is below. So we very, very quickly respond to this action within two seconds and dynamically track the frequency and help to bring the grid back into balance again. 
So you've got some instability on the left-hand side of my previous chart. You've got wind energy coming on as an example. Example number two, football. <laughs> so National Grid used this example quite a lot. When people watch EastEnders, at the end of EastEnders, they go and turn the kettle on. With big England football games, people go and put the kettle on or they might open the fridge to get a cold beverage of their choice. So you end up with a demand spike, and National Grid have to do something about that. Uh, this shows the various England games at half-time and full-time. There was up to a gigawatt of demand that suddenly went on the system. Um, annoyingly for me, National Grid are actually really good at managing these events because they're quite predictable. But right in the middle of the Uruguay game, uh, Drax, a big coal-fired power station, failed. Num unit number five failed, and so we actually saw a massive frequency dip during that game. Not because people were drinking beer and drinking tea, but because the power station failed. Anyway, that's the sort of stuff we do. We do very, very fine tuning of demand to make sure that demand and supply are in balance. Who we do that with, we work with very large consumers of energy. So taking the example of the water sector, on the left-hand side, we control some stuff. So variable speed drives, odor control fans, which are exactly as they say, they blow smell around because <coughs> sewage is really stinky. Uh, pumps, motors, aeration units, there's lots of different assets we can control. Uh, and the benefit to them, they get some revenue from National Grid. National Grid pay us for our overall service and we share that with the clients. Um, they get to contribute to carbon reduction on the grid because rather than using gas and coal for balancing, you're using the demand side. They get some process optimization. There's a ridiculous amount of data that we collect in the process and we show all that to them. Um, and generally, everyone's all better off. Um, I think that's just a very quick introduction from myself, but I'll hand over. Fantastic. Again, thanks for having us all here today. <clears throat> um, I'm coming from Energy Deck, and we uh, don't do anything to do with demand response, so we're slightly different. We're a new online energy management platform. And what we're actually about is um, how do people, or how do we get people to get data and then share that data and share the knowledge around energy efficiency or around how demand response works, for example. Um, so what, what we've found in the industry, and my, personally myself and my previous jobs, uh, and also in just in, in talking to the industry, is that there's a, there's a lack of sharing between organizations and within organizations around energy management practices, around energy efficiency projects, around how you gather data, around how you do the reporting. It's very hard to actually share that data. Um, so what uh, our company does is make that easy. Um, you're all well aware, I guess, of the um, challenge facing energy efficiency uh, around the world. Uh, for us, the central reason behind a lot of that challenge, behind a lot of the breakdown, is what traditionally would be called the split incentive. So the inability of different parties or different stakeholders to communicate to each other effectively. Uh, which means uh, you end up with incomplete data, so each stakeholder will have a slightly different data set. Um, there is no information sharing, and often if there is, it's done via email and spreadsheets, um, which means there's a lack of insight. So people are not actually aware of what's going on in their own building, let alone in similar buildings. They don't even know what, which buildings are similar. Um, and then there's a lack of trust, and this is actually a very, very big issue in the industry. So um, I can't count the number of times I've seen projects not go ahead because of a lack of trust in the potential outcome not a failing of the finance, not a failing of the technology, just a pure failing of the interpersonal relationships between all the stakeholders involved. Uh, this is a figure we use. I'm not entirely convinced it's the right figure, but there's a, there's a massive energy efficiency saving opportunity um, globally in the marketplace today. Um, so what we're building is that central platform for energy and resource management in buildings. Um, importantly, what we're trying to do is create a platform which understands what a building actually is and how it operates and how it's used. So traditionally, for example, benchmarks are based on a building type, so you might get an office or a school or a retail unit. What we really want to be able to say is this office has an investment bank in it, whereas that office has a travel agent in it. And so they have fundamentally different uses of their energy, different times of day, different, different demands. So really understand the buildings. At the same time, we're trying to pick up any kind of data you want to throw at the system, whether that's environmental data like temperature, relative humidity, CO2, whether it's consumption data like energy, whether it's production data like number of widgets or how many room nights you might use in a hotel. So how do we, how do we get that data into the system easily? It comes to Energy Deck. Uh, and then, based on all the data, based on the knowledge of the built environment, we can actually provide uh, logical and uh, meaningful information off the back of that. Now, the tracking and the sharing is pretty standard. You'll see that in most energy management platforms today. What you won't see is shared benchmarking. Shared benchmarking is taking everyone's data, everyone's knowledge about the buildings, anonymizing it, and then passing that data back out to the users. And so the conversation 
will go. We have 10,000 officers in our database, but based on all the information you have, you're similar to these 250. So when we talk about efficiency or the impact of energy efficiency projects, we'll look at your peer group and we'll draw information and knowledge from that peer group. The other piece of the puzzle is project validation. And so we, we have an algorithm which will calculate the actual savings from an energy efficiency project. And by project, that could be changing the light bulbs. Equally, it could be running a behavior change project. Equally, it could be putting demand response in, into your site. And we'll validate the actual savings uh, generated from that project. We then anonymize that information and, again, push that out into the world so that other people can learn from, from uh, users. Put the two of those things together, and we're aiming to have a recommendation engine. So that's it. Core USP is crowdsourcing, building, and project performance data. And it's about bringing those all together and then sharing it back out into the community. Um, so how we like to talk about where we're positioned is um, between a traditional energy management system and between the Internet of Things platforms. And, and we're sort of sitting in the middle. So we want to, to behave like an Internet of Things platform uh, and, and that we can take any amount of data, any type of data, but we want to be able to con contextualize it into energy in the built environment. So make that data useful. This is a quote uh, that kind of backs that up. This is, our aim is to get this, 15 minutes is too long, is to get the data flowing as fast as is humanly possible so people can stop running up against uh, the, the traditional issues of actually acquiring and then using data. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, my name is Philip. Uh, here's an answer from Unicus. Um, let me just briefly, oh, oh, unfortunately, I should have brought a PDF. We have a very uh, special font, and that doesn't work with it. So please uh, excuse the, uh, the strange font, because I uh, should have sent a PDF. Um, anyway, who are we? Um, we are um, an international, uh, really intelligent grid and storage company. And I'm very grateful to my predecessors for basically explaining all about uh, frequency uh, so I don't have to do the homework and uh, lay the, uh, the, out the, the land as I usually have to. Um, very quickly, what do we do? Um, we do everything between an AC grid uh, that has an uh, alternating current grid with the frequency and a DC power source on the one hand from the technical side of view. Uh, if you want to look at from uh, a market's point of view, um, we help uh, um, essentially integrate uh, renewable power by making the grids more stable. There are two business cases for that. Number one is things like uh, uh, grid frequency control, um, which we typically provide to, to TSOs. We've just um, uh, commissioned Europe's first commercial battery power plant. And the other thing is enabling off-grid solutions. And there we've just, uh, I was just on Graziosa, where we broke ground to build the first up to 100% renewable energy system in the megawatt range. Um, yeah, that's just uh, um, uh, offerings. That's very boring. Uh, this is very important to us. Uh, you, you may remember these uh, sector signs. Uh, they were based in Berlin. Uh, um, um, we are. We grew out of the solar industry, out of, founded by a couple of solar pioneers, and started looking at storage back in 2005, and to identify storage technologies. And I'm very happy that our findings were again validated today uh, by the experts. Uh, we decided to use uh, three electrochemical storage uh, um, um, technologies, vanadium redox flow, sodium sulfur, and mainly lithium ion, which we rely on mainly, but we also installed the first sodium sulfur battery in, Europe, in the European grid, for instance. And back in 2005, when our predecessor company was founded, it was clear that the cost of solar would come down, and uh, that just by the industrial process, as we had always predicted, but that if we want to be serious about uh, moving to uh, uh, renewables-based energy generation and uh, uh, serious about uh, combating climate change, then we need to look at storage, and nobody was willing to do that. Um, but this sign is there always to remind us what our real mission is. Um, what does that mean in terms of business models? Uh, I think we're all in agreement uh, uh, on this one. The days of the old utility model where we had centralized power system, a big co-fired other thermal power, power plants providing you know, uh, power to some sort of de decentralized uh, uh, customers, 
uh, over. We need flexible solutions. And above all, I would argue, we need the ability to entirely turn off thermal generators, be they small generators, diesel generators in remote islands, uh, um, or large thermal coal-fired power plants. And uh, storage is one way of providing the very, very fast grid, uh, grid services like primary frequency regulation. Um, when do we need what kind of storage? This is always very important for me to share because we also looked at this. And generally, when people talk about storage, they tend to think, and renewables, you tend to think that you would at least you know, need to bring the night, uh, uh, the day into the night, and uh, the, 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 the storm into the doldrums. But that's not actually the case. Our research has shown, and it's actually quite obvious when you look at islands, is that even uh, without storage, your annual share of renewables is limited to something like 15, 20, maximum of 30% renewable energy per year. Um, why is that? Essentially because you can't switch off the thermal unit. Um, just the ability to switch off the thermal unit, just very, very, very little uh, storage in terms of duration, will enable you to cross that threshold and bring you up to as much as 50, 60% renewables. And it's only at this point that you actually need to look into hourly storage. And then if you want to go above 75%, then you really need to go into seasonal storage. And then you're, and just in terms of the economics of it, you wouldn't be looking at batteries anymore, but at, at changing the, uh, the, 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 the energy uh, carrier, i.e. hydrogen or stuff like that. Um, but that's always important to remind people because, you know, well, especially in Germany, uh, where, of course, we're based uh, in, in this uh, energy uh, transition discussion, people always, it's been our experience that people want to take the tenth step before the first. But the first step is to turn up the ability to turn off coal fire power and other uh, thermal power plants when they're not needed. Uh, we heard before uh, that apparently Germany has periods where there's too much renewables on the grid. Uh, that is actually not the case. There has never been uh, a point... Uh, in, uh, up to now, where there were more renewables in the grid in Germany than demand. Thing is, uh, we have um, uh, a minimum demand of about 45 gigawatts in Germany, um, 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 mean demand of about si uh, uh, 60. Uh, but we also have about 25 gigawatts of must-run thermal capacity that must be online at all times. And now, uh, if you're at 45 gigawatts and then 20 gigawatts of renewable energy is just enough to be too much. But that's not, I wouldn't argue that's too much. I would argue that's still not enough. And again, I would remind you all of the latest IPPC report. And uh, again, this is very boring of, uh, uh, and of course, of course doesn't work in uh, uh, what we do. Um, the, the terms of system services that we can provide are Basically, all the system services that are provided by a large rotating mass, and it really doesn't matter. I mean, it's just steam. It's steam-powered. It doesn't matter if it's nuclear or coal or whatever. And then um, also some services. A couple of reference projects I just mentioned. The island of Graciosa it looks very nice in this picture. I would caution you all who always, uh, people always congratulate me on my travels to Graciosa. It's very much like Ireland. It's just a lot further away. It takes you, um, um, I, I set a new record coming back this time around. I made it in one day back to Berlin, but usually it takes two. Um, and, but I was delayed for a day because the plane couldn't land uh, uh, because of fog. And if the plane can't land, it can't leave. So, uh, but um, we are actually uh, we actually have a lot more. Uh, these were just um, the, the uh, also the, the facility in Schwerin is the most advanced, uh, the first commercial European uh, power plant. As I mentioned that because it's the most advanced, uh, we're actually about to commission uh, 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 um, a facility just north uh, northeast here, of London, with UK Power Networks and also with Kiwi Power, and we're also involved in this. Um, and yeah, as you can see, we have a couple of projects all around the play globe. Yeah, that's me. Well, supposed to be. Thanks. I hope it's me now. It's <laughs> definitely <laughs> Okay, awesome. Um, are you guys okay? Is anyone bored? Five presentations, or are we all okay? 
Um, so we're, we're Kiwi Power. Um, we develop and commercialize the technology for demand response. Um, because we've got a bit of time. How many people have heard of demand response before today? A few. How many people have heard of Kiwi Power out of interest? Oh, wow. And how many people, because I went to school here versus whatever? Oh, <laughs> awesome. That's great. I, I, I asked the question because it's always good to know um, who knows about this stuff. But uh, actually, you've heard an awful lot about what demand response is, and most of you seem to know, so I can probably run through these slides. But you know, people call it the killer app of the smart grid. We do an awful lot of educating event customers and, and explain what this stuff is. And we sort of settled in a model that looks like this, where we've just got a very basic grid with some power stations um, on, on, in gray over here and consumers in, in green. And most of the time, the system works. We can predict pretty accurately how much people need. Um, but then some of the time, we find ourselves with an extra demand compared to what we expected, or extra demand because it's a very cold day. Everyone's waiting for England to win or lose or whatever. And, and and in order to fulfill that extra demand, we use peaking power stations. Now, around 10% statistically of any given grid in terms of capacity is used for these peaks for only about 1% of the year, and they tend to be the worst power stations. They tend to be the most polluting, the most expensive to run, and the oldest, and we wouldn't have them unless we actually needed them to avoid a blackout. So what demand response is is really simple. We're putting smart software and hardware inside the consumer so that we can reduce their consumption instead of switching on the power station. Economically, what's happening is rather than giving a payment to a power station, we're giving a payment to the consumers. So that, that's it. And what we're doing is really replacing this, which is polluting fossil fuel power stations and, and really expensive reinforcement of the network, into this, which is much smarter controls of our homes and our cities. And we're doing it because it's green. It's simply greener to turn down some air conditioning or to shift around demand. We're doing it because it's better for renewables when we have, you just heard, when we have more renewables, we need more flexibility on the demand side. And we're doing it because it's cheaper. Um, our end customers do it because we pay them which I think I have a slide for. Right, so our RN customers, you know, they care about all this stuff, but really they do it because we pay them to do it. So they sign up with us, uh, we install all the equipment, we get them up and running, and they just get a check in the post every month as if they were a power station. A lot of companies do it also because it's a green thing to do, and on the stack of priorities, they'll always pick the one which is really cheap. Um, they do it because it's, it's good for uh, uh, carbon and, and because the way we do it, there's no cost, and, and I'll show you that in a second. We, we sort of break down our process of what we do into four stages, and I'd say that we spend 95% of our time in that first box. And most companies out there, even though this is starting to become more commonplace in terms of knowledge and, 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 and in terms of case studies, most people don't really know how this works. Most people don't know what national grid is. Most people know electricity sort of comes from the wall and they pay for it. And so we spend an awful lot of our time educating the customer, but also helping them to understand what demand they can turn down. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of case studies in a second. We install all the communication equipment, the metering, and the controls they need. We do the operations, and we bill. And the way that my company works is we do all of this for the customer for free. So we don't charge them for the hardware. We don't charge them for the software. We don't charge them for the audit. Um, we bill National Grid. National Grid pays us just like we're a power station. And then instead of burning diesel, we give the money to the end customers. Um, just some examples of some of the companies we work with. Um, we, we're broadly split between commercial, industrial, and government. Um, and I'd say that government is probably growing faster than all the rest because, frankly, they need the money the most. And so we've got a lot of hospitals <laughs> we're working with, um, and it's just a great way to suddenly find some extra money in their budget and to fulfill their green ambitions. Um, we, we produce all of our own software and hardware in-house. So we have some fantastic apps we give to the customer. Um, we, we produce the hardware that goes with it as well. Um, this is a beautiful picture of our beautiful control center, which is about five minutes away. Anyone wants to come, send me an email, come have a look, literally in, in the middle of Soho. Um, and uh, just a, a picture of where we are today. Well, actually, this is a bit old now. Um, but uh, we have 700 sites in the UK today, which is by far the largest network like this in the country. Um, our ambition is to develop this technology and to scale internationally. Um, we've got an office in Singapore and a couple of sites over there. And we've got big ambitions for Europe uh, in the next few years. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. Um, so you've heard some interesting perspectives uh, on this new innovation landscape. Now we're hoping now that we're going to have a really good uh, discussion with you. So does anyone want to start off the questions and get the discussion going? Otherwise I've got a whole list here, but y you should be driving this. <laughs> Go ahead. Is 
No, it would be helpful if you just state your name and organisation. Um, my name's Aloysius Fekata. Uh, just a, a question, uh, a philosophical <coughs> question about demand response. If you were able to turn down that air conditioning, did you need it in the first place? So isn't it, isn't it really a question of, well, just being more efficient and, and better use of resources? Yeah, you know, it's a, sorry, does anyone mind? Yeah, no, you go it's ahead. A, it's, it's a really good question, and, and we get it a lot. And actually, I'll, I'll give you the converse of that question, which is when I pitch to a facility manager at a hotel, every single time he'll say, I'm already efficient, there's nothing that I can't do. The, I, you know, I didn't invent it, therefore it's crap. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's the same issue. And the, the way to look at it is that, you know, we like lights, we like heat, we like air conditioning in the summer, and there's no way to, you know, we shouldn't get rid of that. The point is not to go backwards. The point is that when you run your air conditioner at 4 p.m., it has one particular impact on cost and, and, and impact on the environment. When you're running it at 4.30, because there's a peak at the time, the impact is five times, ten times as high. And by reducing for that half hour or one hour period, which is pretty much the most we ever do, um, you're having a massively oversized impact in terms of cost and, and, the, and the environmental benefits. And the fact is, if I turned off the air conditioner in here now um, for half an hour, no one would notice. If I did for eight hours, people would, you know, you guys will start to notice. So it's about temporarily shifting stuff rather than making the permanent changes. Both are important, but the temporary stuff is free. The, the permanent stuff costs a lot of money, so we like to start with the temporary stuff. And as we go into a more renewable uh, intermittent grid mix, that flexibility starts to have more and more value. So being able to do some pre-cooling, which may, from your point of view, not seem as efficient, from a price and from a using renewable power when it's available, um, it makes a lot of sense to do that pre-cooling. Mm, it, it, it's just all about timing. So... An air conditioner will turn on and off randomly throughout the day based on its set points. All we're doing with demand response is optimizing that in a different way. So listening to what National Grid wants or listening to what the wholesale energy market is telling you in terms of costs and just moving where that consumption happens to a large extent. Okay, but great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, do you want to get the microphone? Sorry, Sorry just... Yeah. We'll come to you next, Darren. Hello, I'm Manuela Nessa from the European Bank for Reconstruction Development and also from LBS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I just had a question if you could all say a bit more about your financing models. I, I know quite a lot about um, demand side management and things, but probably sort of how, because two of you deal with national grid mostly, um, you get something also from the, the industrial side, but probably you could expand on this, sort of how you finance it, because a lot of this is always talk about how do you really get it financed. Like when we invest in, in Eastern Europe, it's, it's very difficult to sort of see, you know, where the financial streams really come from. So. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start on that and, and we can move on. I mean, <clears throat> the reality is um, that as an entrepreneur, uh, you spend an insanely large amount of your time doing cash flow management uh, because you never have enough money. So financing is a, is a very big part of this. So, for example, last year I worked four different consulting jobs to push the money into the business to be able to develop our technology. Uh, we've also received um, a Technology Strategy Board Smart Grant, uh, and we're just in the process of getting a loan from the GLA Growing Places Fund, and we are now also closing an investment. Uh, but to get this, um, these innovative technologies uh, off the ground and to get a different business model working in a sector that really doesn't want change, let's not pretend that everyone else is standing around clapping for the, the businesses that we're bringing in, uh, no, we're disrupting the market. We're taking some of the revenue away. Uh, so it is definitely challenging. Uh, but as with any good business idea, uh, you will get financing. You just have to keep, uh, keep going, keep trying. Um, maybe okay. just to give, just to I completely agree, venture capital here sucks and there's a real <laughs> shortage of money for innovation. Um, I, uh, maybe your question is around how does actually the customer get paid for this and where does that money come from? Um, so, and, and you know, this is something that isn't immediately intuitive, but the, 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 the way that we end up paying the businesses who work with us is because everyone here pays, and it, we're paying through the electricity that, that we're consuming right now. The point is, 
by paying a factory to, to shut down production for an hour or a hotel to turn down its air conditioner, it's actually cheaper than using a power station. So all of us end up saving money from the first kilowatt that's in there, and every additional kilowatt saves us even more money. And, and you know, that, that's one of the important things about it. The, the, the sort of the flip side of that is who actually pays for all the equipment and who pays for all of this stuff. And the answer is, as far as I know, the only way to do it is equity. Um, I haven't been able to raise any bank debt, haven't been able to get any kind of smart structures around it. Um, and so there's a really strong incentive for us to reduce as much as possible our costs. And one of the things we did is when we started, we were buying equipment from sort of industry leaders in, in the States, because that's where they have most of this stuff. And we were finding the equipment wasn't really suited um, for what we needed to do into, because it's not really real time. Um, and actually, I'll, 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 you know, I'll go so far as to say the energy space is kind of stuck 20 years ago when it comes to technology. The software is terrible mm -hmm. and the hardware is expensive. And it's because they mm -hmm. manufacture stuff like we did 20 years ago and that's what they're doing today. We built our hardware platform based on the, the, the chip from the first iPhone. And what we have is a processor that runs at 500 megahertz compared to a Siemens device that runs at 5 megahertz. But this one costs $2 because Apple's made a billion of them. And by doing this, and this wasn't possible even three years ago. You just couldn't do this. Because we've done this all in the last couple of years, we've brought down our average installation cost from around 8,000 pounds a site um, to something like 300 pounds a site. And now we're measuring the payback in terms of we pay for the equipment. The revenue we generate from grid pays that back in about two weeks. So actually, financing isn't really the big challenge over here in terms of making it happen. Um, but there's still definitely a shortage of sort of innovation finance in general. Yeah, um, if I can add to that, and maybe also another perspective. Um, one thing is uh, about the level playing field, about the uh, uh, incumbents there. For instance, if I look at what we do in primary frequency regulation, I also have a system services. But essentially, store, and this doesn't just go for Unicus, this goes for all sorts of batteries, combined with a little bit of intelligence, essentially what is in your iPhone, you know? We're talking about 50 hertz here, yeah? This has something like 2.6 gigahertz. So, uh, uh, um, the, the, you know, we are a lot faster and a lot more precise than a thermal power plant. However, we get paid, we, if we compete in the primary regulation, uh, frequency regulation market, we get paid exactly the same. Um, if you switch all of uh, uh, primary frequency regulation to batteries, and I'm not just saying to ours, uh, you would need less of them. The entire system would be uh, cheaper. Uh, the cost is, of course, the money doesn't fall from the sky. It's spread amongst the customers. Everybody would profit. Um, of course, you know, people preventing that. Another on our, and, and uh, so there's, um, th there's difficulty in that. And then the other problem is um, that, of course, it's new technology. I mean, we were a couple of, uh, 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 I guess uh, my colleagues here can relate, and we built the first commercial power plant in Europe. You know, everybody says it's interesting, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, let's face it, I mean, I had a brief career in investment banking, so I'm allowed to uh, bash bankers a little. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, bankers are terribly uh, stupid. I mean, uh, 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 and uh, they, they will just do what everybody Still else has done. Still by the whole panel, by the way. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, you know, if you build 10 of these things, then it's easier. Um, and thirdly, um, as, as a lot of the, our systems really save money in remote uh, areas because diesel fuel is ridiculously expensive. Um, but the problem is that, again, it's difficult to get financing for this, not necessarily because the system doesn't work, um, but simply because um, people do not understand country risk and are not able to pool uh, country risk. I mean, stuff, I mean, I didn't go to LBS, I went to LSE, but uh, I learned some, some things there in my finance class that I would think could be applied here, but it's apparently very difficult just to pool different uh, uh, risk assets uh, in different geographic areas to just to bring down the financing costs. And then if you have the development banks that are stepping in, then unfortunately we find that uh, it's a tender business, which of course is good uh, because it prevents corruption, but then the tenders are often written in such a terrible, terrible way, if you don't mind me saying, uh, uh, that the system doesn't make any more sense. And uh, and, but we can't consult them on writing the tenders, eh? because uh, if we write the tender, then we can't sell our system. So these are the problems that we face. Just a very well, it's slightly different angle, a different point of view, that, that fundraising is, well, funding is very hard, we've discovered, to come by, particularly in the software 
uh, where we, there isn't sort of a physical product to show people at the end of the day. And also particularly because we're in what we term an enabling platform. So we, as a rule, we wouldn't save you or, or make you any money, but we'd show you how to save and make money. So convincing people what that ROI is is actually a very, very tricky sort of thing to do. Um, the other problem is that we're dependent on the technologies around us. So the real blocker for us rolling out is the cost of metering, the cost of monitoring, but we are seeing that plummet. And so we're talking today, it'll cost a thousand pounds to, to meter and monitor a home with, with a whole bunch of different sensors. But we're talking to companies who are developing sensors that'll be worth pounds and pence. And so it's gonna cost 10, 20 pounds to do a whole home. And so that's probably two or three years away, but at that point, there's gonna be a deluge of data um, because the technology will catch up to what's actually available. But um, depending on whether you are directly providing savings or one step back makes a massive difference in terms of, of how easy that funding is to get. Okay, we had a, we had another question, I think. Ian Staffel, Imperial College Business School. Um, Sarah, I was really interested in the Christmas wish list that you suggested. Yeah. <laughs> as I think exactly the same things are uh, wanted for uh, storage providers as well. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate some more on the, the things that you think are really the key issues that are blocking... Uh, demand side and storage companies from achieving you know, a fair revenue for the service that they're giving? Sure, and then I'll throw it open to the panel as well. Uh, there are a lot of areas where storage providers uh, and demand side technologies uh, you know, have a great deal in common. So, for example, um, in looking at how the capacity market has been constructed, is everyone familiar with what the capacity market is? Could we just have a very quick show of hands? So I don't want to bore you about it unless you... Uh, yeah, some of you do, some of you don't. So basically, the government's bringing in this new policy framework that's going to pay um, a, a reserve amount to keep about uh, 50 gigawatts of um, capacity available uh, in terms of peak demand. Now, that capacity could either come by increasing generation or it, would come, it could come by reducing demand or it could come from storage. So if you're an owner of a generator, you're desperately keen to get your hands on this market. And there's a lot of fear in this market because companies have invested very heavily in traditional generation uh, and things are changing. And when things change, it becomes a little bit difficult to work out what your business model is going to look like in the future, and that's a bit scary. Uh, so against that backdrop, those companies lobby to, to keep the status quo going for as long as possible and to keep those revenue uh, streams going. So if we think about how the capacity market has been uh, designed from a demand side and from a storage um, side, and this is quite illustrative of um, what the issues are, uh, we have open-ended events. So what that means is Yov, uh, for example, or Chris has to go to a customer and say, there's great new uh, um, revenue opportunity. It's called the capacity market. Um, if you sign up to provide capacity when there's a, um, a capacity shortage, you know, the government or through National Grid is going to pay you some money, which will ultimately be paid for by customers. But there's just one problem. Once the, the capacity market event uh, starts, you have to keep delivering indefinitely. If you don't, we're going to penalise you, and those penalties will be more than the original revenue stream. So I think you can understand why that's quite a hard sell to a customer. Uh, now, if you're a storage unit, you can't commit to deliver indefinitely. Eventually, the storage runs out. If you're a customer, you're not in the market to be a generator. You might be making cars or uh, another type of product. Eventually, you have to make the cars. So if you construct the rules so that only generators can play, you end up with generators. Now, it seems in, insanely uh, clear. Now, a child can understand this. This is a, a market that is, has been designed for generators. The Minister of Energy doesn't understand it, though. But no, sadly... The Minister the of Energy <laughs> never understands these things. Yes, he doesn't get it. Yeah, they, they don't understand. So we believe very strongly that this is, as an industry, we believe that this is a, an unfair market that has been designed for one resource type. So not only are, do we have these open-ended events, uh, but we also have different contract lengths. So as a customer providing this security of supply, you can get a one-year contract. As a generator, you can get up to 15 years. Now, in... 
countries like the UK, uh, we have something called competition law. I mean, there are definitely countries out, out there where you could get this policy framework to fly, uh, but in this country, we have competition law. Uh, and that's why these things uh, don't work. This needs to be a level playing field. And fundamentally, all of the technologies we're talking about here today and these business models, uh, as long as you deliver a level playing field, then we will come in and we'll compete and we'll drive down the cost of energy. But if the market is stacked to favor only one resource type, it's a, a, an awful lot harder to bring that cost saving to customers. I'm not sure if anyone else would like to come in, maybe from storage. Yeah, I mean, uh, no, but uh, actually, the uh, same thing holds for, for storage. I mean, the, um, and it's, uh, and I mean, it, let, let, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, this entire thing is about uh, regulatory change uh, 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 as much as it is. I mean, we always talk about innovation, and yes, I mean, innovation is there, um, but innovation needs to be enabled, and uh, now, after the pharmaceutical sector, and I worked as a political consultant, the uh, energy sector is by far the most lobby-prone uh, 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 sector. Uh, and that's, you know, if you're an economist, it's very simple because, you know, essentially you have a very inelastic demand curve and you could, uh, there were times you could basically push everything onto consumers and you have very few uh, uh, suppliers, uh, uh, utilities that have a great functioning business model, and they will spend lots and lots of money defending that. Uh, and, and plus, you have the uh, fossil fuel industry that also has huge uh, uh, um, incentives to uh, to prevent a new, decentral, smart, clean grid from emerging uh, and energy system from emerging. Let's not kid ourselves about that. And so it's about, and the thing is, okay, the, the, the UK um, capacity mechanism is new. We're also talking about one in Germany. There are different things going on in the States. Um, uh, but a lot of the energy, this energy framework that we have was made uh, back when a lot of the technology, actually all of the technologies we're, we're talking about uh, 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 representing this uh, panel weren't, uh, weren't around or weren't even conceivable. The only thing that we had uh, uh, were generators. I mean, the what's called the tertiary reserve, you have th 15 minutes to kick in. Why is it 15 minutes? Because it takes 15 minutes for a gas-fired power plant when it's hot to fire up. I mean, the, the, these things didn't f fly from, uh, 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 from the sky. I mean, they, they were modeled around the existing technologies, just as the rules nowadays should be modeled around the technologies that we have now, but of course you have lots of people that have no, absolutely no interest in making that happen. Anyone else like to make a comment? Yeah, very briefly. I mean, I think it's yes. a very, very shrewd comment. Uh, absolutely, that Christmas list doesn't apply just to demand-side response. It applies to storage. It applies to anything that can provide a degree of flexibility. Um, but as Philip just said, the, the rules, I mean, if you look at the rules of the capacity market, it's for delivery in 2018, four years away. It takes about four years to build a gas-fired power station. Again, that's a convenient, interesting point. Um, uh, and again, when it comes to primary regulation or frequency response, it's very much geared around generation, what a generation asset can do. There's the requirements. I think for now, we may have to bend to some degree. Um, I think in order to displace generation off the system, we'll probably have to play by some of their rules. But at the minute, it's definitely 100% focused on generation. There's no movement. We need to see some movement in order to reduce the barriers to entry and to see the innovation come through the system. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yes, down here. Um, Dua Levy from LBS. A question for uh, you have. I'm not sure I understood fully the business model. Where does the profit come from. Um, what I understand is that you install the hardware and the software at your expense at the consumer's side. There is saving because of, or thanks to the software and hardware. And then you manage to provide a check for them. So where do you get the money sure. that was saved? It's uh, the, the, the really sort of nice thing about our business model is 
there's a small saving for the customer because they're saving energy, but the real money comes because we're selling this reduction to national grid. They're paying us because they don't have to pay a power station. So literally, we're receiving a big check from national grid, hopefully a really big check from national grid. We're keeping some of it, and our margins are pretty high. Um, and the rest of it we give to our own customers. And what, what we do is we, just like a single stock is risky, multiple stocks in a portfolio are less risky, what our system does is pick those customers that are correlated with each other in the best way to give as stable uh, a demand curve as possible. And by creating this portfolio, we've got less risk and more demand response in there, just like a portfolio of stocks does. So we make our money by managing that portfolio as well as possible. Um, the, so the consumer, yeah, the, the, actually consumers don't pay National Grid in this country. Consumers pay their supplier, and now they're receiving a check from, from Kiwi, effectively. So nothing changes on the supply side, and that's also a good thing because changing a supply contract is pretty cumbersome. And so when a customer signs up with us, they sign one piece of paper, nothing else changes. Um, they just start getting a check every month. Uh, just a question about the capacity market and its linkage to what your business models are. So my understanding is that if you sign up to this capacity market and the national grid comes and says, we need capacity right now, you're legally obligated to provide capacity and for an indefinite period of time, etc. So in your business models right now, when the national grid comes and says to Kiwi Power, we need this much capacity, do you have to do this from your customers? Yeah. So we, we need to deliver the capacity just like a power station does, otherwise we're hit with hefty penalties. Okay. What, what we do is we use this portfolio approach to make sure we can deliver. So every hotel or shopping center or airport or hospital or whatever on my portfolio doesn't have to deliver to me. If they don't deliver, they'll see their earnings reduced. What, what I do is keep my portfolio to a percentage level, which I know I can deliver 100% to National Grid when I need to. And is this also an indefinite delivery as the capacity no, market? No, we, we, we actually have Amazingly enough, we have 20 different demand response programs we're doing today, mostly in, in the UK, either with National Grid or with some of the distribution system operators. We don't have any which have like an uncapped event. Um, the longest we have is three hours, the shortest we have is 15 minutes, um, and the average is two hours. Um, but actually, the average event, I checked it today, um, we've had something like 300 demand response events over the last 24 months, um, the average is 58 minutes. So it's more or less what you'd expect. So that kind of really demonstrates that there isn't really a need to have unending events. But it's very clear that unending events skew the market because only one resource can deliver unending events. And it's totally not necessary. There's actually one additional point of interest to add to that. So as part of the capacity rules, you have a thing called the derating factor. So National Grid has said, this is how reliable a nuclear power station is, this is how reliable a coal-fired power station is, this is how reliable pump storage is, this is how reliable we think demand response is, and demand response is pretty near the top of the list. I forget where it appears, but it's certainly more reliable in National Grid's eyes than a lot of other technologies out there. Um, so in terms of can we deliver, we've proved that we have um, with the other balancing services we sell. I'll tell you something interesting. When demand response fails to deliver, um, it actually does a lot better than when a power station fails to deliver. Because when a power station fails, it's off, right? You, you try and switch it on, something blows up, and the power station doesn't work. We've had some portfolios that haven't delivered, but when they haven't delivered, our average delivery is something like 88%, because we still have most of the portfolio delivering. Um, and you know that's, again, it's a function of having uh, uh, an aggregated uh, portfolio of bits that aren't correlated together is just much less risky. You know, finance people get this, energy people tend not to get this mm -hmm. right away. And actually, during the, uh, the polar vortex in the States in January this year, uh, a number of power stations uh, didn't deliver. And it was very, very cold, uh, airports were closed. Actually, it was demand side customers who kept the lights on and kept the heat on. Uh, in February 2012 here, there was a Saturday morning when seven power stations tripped as they came on. The demand side kept the lights on in this country. So, I mean, this is a resource that, because it's distributed, is actually very reliable. Uh, more questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I had a, um, my name's Alistair Fury. I'm from LBS. I just had a question about risk, especially for the demand response and storage as well. Um, a risk for your, as a, like, your businesses, basically. Uh, given that you have this very sh short window of pricing certainty, 
And given that it, the market size isn't massive, especially in the UK, and the barriers to entry technically are not that high, um, is there not a risk um, that there's going to be pricing pressure on, on downwards on you guys? And especially given, I mean, we had the Tesla outside today, we're expecting increasing penetration of, uh, of electric vehicles, which are medium-sized, tens of kilowatt batteries, quite homogenous, and they're going to be uh, you know, uh, internet connected. Is there not a risk for you in the medium to long term that those num like millions of electric cars are going to basically wipe, wipe you out? In, from, no, we have a slightly different perspective because we're an electricity supplier. Uh, so our job is to come in and manage the cost for the customer as much as possible. So where a customer has an electric vehicle, uh, we would charge that vehicle at the lowest cost. So when renewables are plentiful, we would do that charging. So our business model is not really impacted by growing resources in that sense because we're optimising for commodity cost, for the cost of the delivery infrastructure, as well as the, the revenue that comes from uh, demand response. But the, the, uh, now I'll hand it over to the other guys to, to answer as well. But I was just going to say that there's, uh, we're in our infancy um, in this market. So there is a lot of scope for growing demand flexibility and for using those services. And the more we have intermittency in renewables, the more that grows, because only the demand side or batteries can rise to, to take power when there's too much power. Uh, so I, I think the opportunities, I am not in any way concerned by not having enough opportunities. I think the opportunity is actually massive. Would you like to? Um, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I think there's two parts to it. One is, how easy is it to do demand response? So how quickly will pricing pressure bring down profits? And then two is, how storage and EVs and stuff affects the market? On the first one, um, you know, I, I actually agree. Um, I do think that the barriers to entry are relatively low on the one hand compared to building a power station um, because you need much less money. On the other hand, the technology that's involved in, in doing this in the right way and, and the skills involved in, in getting the right kind of demand response isn't so easy. We've been doing it for five years and we're only scratching the surface. Um, in, in the States, you look at the market leaders, actually they've been doing it for a good 10, 15 years and their margins are pretty stable. You've got a lot of stickiness and, and a part of it, I think, is once you've learned how to work with the customer, you've got this learning that builds up over time and you get to know them. And so for the customer to make a switch to someone else, they actually have quite a big risk in, in switching provider. And at the end of the day, we're the icing on the cake. We're never going to be at the front of somebody's mind. Um, and uh, you know, people don't change the icing. It's tasty. You want to keep it. Um, but, but no, I, I think you know, at the end of the day, the competition is there against the fossil fuel power stations. If those prices come down, which they should, because that means we're all saving money, um, I think demand response is the one that benefits from it, because it means we've actually had an impact on the market. And in terms of EVs, so, so we actually have an EV project uh, that we've been doing for a couple of years now with Shell. And we, we built an entire managed charging system, not, uh, not, with, um, not with Teslas, I wish, um, with Nissan Leafs, which I drive, which is less cool. Um, there, there's a couple of things that, that are really interesting. One is you know, people really underestimate how difficult it's going to be to roll out EVs. Number one, because look, you switch over 5 or 10% of cars to electric vehicles, that is your grid in order to supply them. It's as simple as that. They use up a lot of power. The average house uses about two kilowatts. The average EV, when you plug it in, just on a normal sort of fast charge, we're talking seven kilowatts. So when I plug my car into my house, that's like adding three houses into my house. So number one, you've got the energy you need to supply, but you've also got the capacity to connect it up because we didn't build our houses to have another four houses sitting on top of them. So mm -hmm. I actually think that when we see, and I fully believe we'll see a takeoff of EVs because they're fantastic, when we see that takeoff, we're going to need this kind of smart, smarter demand all over the place. EVs can provide some of it, um, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's not enough. Um, vehicle to grid is also really, really hard. Our distribution network wasn't built for it. Um, I think it's going to take us a while. The day the batteries become free or, or really, really cheap, we won't need demand response anymore. That, that I fully agree with. Um, um, it's a great question, if I may add to that. I mean, I, I fully agree, though I am very, unfortunately, somewhat skeptical about uh, uh, the, the quick rise of EVs. Um, and your point about the three houses, I, I, I should remember that. I always use the example of California. I mean, if you want to bring down the United States power grid, you just take you know, a full uh, container ship full of EVs from China and plug them all in at the same time. 
and, uh, uh, and that's it. Um, so, the, the, for as far as frequency regulation is concerned, the revenues from that, I mean, we've looked at that because that was a concern, but you have to look at a number of factors, and uh, I think a very good reasons to assume that uh, frequency regulation, primary frequency regulation, these very, very fast system services essentially are going to be at least stable, if not rise, uh, 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 stable at price. You can't really use EVs for that uh, because uh, you need security. You need to be able to provide frequency regulation at all times, and it will be a, lot, a long, long time until you have enough intelligence there to make, uh, to make them. But uh, make, make them do that. But there's another interesting, um, on the other hand, in our off-grid microgrid solutions, um, uh, EVs are a great addition. Because as I quick, tried to quickly explain in the beginning, uh, we actually uh, need uh, very little storage to get up to, uh, and the economic optimum is usually around 60 to 80 percent renewables penetration per year. And then afterwards, you really um, end up, and, and that already lands you with 30% excess energy. And uh, that's, ex that's a clean energy that you can't use and you can't really economically store. Because of course, you could build another battery, but that would just increase your, uh, your system cost. So, um, but that energy is essentially free. And so on islands, where you don't need to drive very far anyway, uh, um, uh, uh, integrating EVs is, uh, uh, is a great... Uh, is a great second step, and we're actually uh, uh, um, uh, talking to a number of uh, surprise uh, German uh, car manufacturers uh, about this. And um, thirdly, um, um, EV, the batteries in EVs have great second use potential uh, uh, for uh, our applications. Now, the, 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 the battery power plant that we just built in Schwerin um, and, this, and, the, and the UKPN bar, uh, uses Sam, Samsung SDI uh, 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 lithium-ion batteries, and these are the exact same batteries that are in the new BMWs, for instance. Uh, the only thing that's different is that we throw our intelligence on top of them and our software, and then Samsung give us 20 years performance warranty, whereas they give seven years to BMW. But uh, if you've used them in a BMW for seven years, then they're down to something like 60, 70%. And that's really not enough to use in an EV, but it's more than enough to take the same cell mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and reuse it in a, 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 in a stationary application where space isn't really that much of an issue. Um, so that actually, quite to the contrary, it has a, a potential to bring down costs on the other hand. At the same time, um, there will be a need for these really fast, uh, 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 continuing need for this fast response. So we, I don't think, uh, Revenues are going to uh, go down, so I, I'm, I'm not at all worried about uh, EVs. Uh, I see them as a great potential on, on many different levels. Okay. Chris, do you have a... I, I think that was epically comprehensive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, this small question uh, for you. Uh, if I understand correctly, when you're saying the demand side response, so let's national grid comes and says, "I need five megawatt." Then you are gonna across your across your customers. Who that time are using that's a 50 megawatt. You will cut five megawatt. So wouldn't you at that stage be required to be a little bit locationally uh, sensitive in the sense that if there is a demand, uh, if National Grid says I need five megawatt in Cumbria, you can't just take out five megawatt in yeah. London. You you would think so, wouldn't you? Um, the answer is no. Um, there's no locational element whatsoever mm -hmm. when it comes to national grid. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that's because it's physically um, not relevant. Um, I think it is physically relevant. I think the systems just have never been built for this. Um, what I will tell you is the stuff we're doing with the distribution system operators, and, and for those of you that don't know, we have national grid, which is the transmission system, which takes the power from the power stations into cities, and then the distribution network, which takes it from sort of the grid supply points into, into homes and that kind of stuff. So we, there, there's six companies in the UK that manage those networks, and with them, it is really location dependent, so we're talking down to a postcode level. Um, so on one side of the street, it's relevant, and the other side of the street, it isn't. Um, we've had really good success with those. They're much harder to sell, but once you do sell them, they're at a premium because the, the local grid needs them a lot. Um, but with National Grid, I think they'll have to get there one day, um, but they're not there yet. So across all of the UK, what do you think is the demand curtailment capacity? Like, what is the maximum it can hit? If, if you look at the states where they've rolled this out to a really large extent, 
And, and I think the, the last number I saw was in PJM, which is sort of the, the, the Northeast, the consumer has saved $12 billion a year um, through wide-scale demand response, which is amazing. Um, and uh, there they get to about 15% of peak demand. So if you apply that to the UK, it means that we've got a potential of about 9 gigawatts. I don't know that we'll get to 9 gigawatts anytime soon, um, but to me, a, a sort of a number of around 6 gigawatts is something that's really worth aiming for. And if we did, we'd be saving hundreds of millions of pounds a year. And I should just add to that, because we, we often make comparisons with the US, uh, but that will, to get to the same level, requires the same market design. And that's a key point that DEC repeatedly uh, avoids mentioning. Uh, so in the US, resources get the same contract length and can bid competitively into the market. So that 15% that Yoves just talked about is competitively bidding in on very similar terms, if not the same terms. That's not the way we've constructed the market in the UK, so we can't hope for the same results. And that's a very important distinction. Because basically, customers will come forward if there's something in it for them. If the right revenue model or the right incentive isn't there, customers will not bother to be flexible. And that's why getting the market right is so important. This is a very valuable resource for UK PLC because it benefits all of us. So we need to get the market right so that we do get to its full potential. You know, I, I, I don't know if this is common knowledge, right? But this isn't something that we should be doing. This is something we kind of have to do. Um, the, the reserve margin in this country this winter and the reserve margin in a, in a normal country that's got a healthy grid is around 15%. This winter, so right now, the reserve margin is going to be as low as 4%, um, and it's going to be worse next year. Um, you know, this isn't something that we should be doing. Um, we need to, as a country, invest £110 billion pounds, um, over the next sort of five, ten years to strengthen our grid and build more power stations, and we just can't afford it. So we need all this stuff to reduce the cost, because otherwise our energy system is going to get too expensive. And you know, we'll sit at home and we'll pay three times the price for electricity and we'll grumble, but a lot of industry can't support that kind of price. So we need this stuff. We, we need this stuff because otherwise we'll just lose a large chunk of industry that we haven't already lost. I don't want to be alarmist or anything. You haven't succeeded. <laughs> no. Hi, uh, Ilian Iliev from Eco Machines Incubator, which is a VC fund. So, from Sorry. what you said, it sounded like no, no, no. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Sorry for what I said about that's VC. why there's a market. For <laughs> you're right. I agree, and that's why there's a market for us. Uh, well, it sounds like all of you have had a bit of an experience on the fundraising side. So, I was wondering what are the key sort of reasons why you, why investors said no and uh, exposed <laughs> why they were wrong. I think we're all here because eventually an investor said yes. So. I wonder who's had the most no's. That's a good question. I mean, we, we are actually closing, literally today, the uh, funding round, uh, angels in the end. Um, we're at a very early stage. The key problem we found is we kept running into early stage VCs who, after an hour or two of talking to them, turned out to be not early stage at all. And in fact, we're not willing to invest in a company with le revenue less than one or two million pounds a year. Um, so. For us, it was actually a messaging thing. There's a lot of VCs who say that they're interested, a lot of people who say they're interested in, in taking risk and investing in startups, but they're actually not. Um, and so it would make life a lot easier just if people um, were uh, admitted that up front. So, yeah, I, and that's not to say that there's, there's necessarily underlying issues with the, with the risk appetite in general in the market, but we've, we found the communication of that risk appetite was, was particularly poor. Um, I mean, I can give you sort of two opinions. Um, I think that. So, so we actually raised our money from high net worths um, at, at two times. And we, we never got a no from a VC because we never gave them the chance to say no. And, and what, one of the real problems that we have, I, I, I don't know about the US, but I know about Europe, is it takes a really long time to do anything. And you know, what's the typical time to get a round closed? You know, we can all sort of put it an average. But I think 12 months is about yeah. right. And 12 months for a million pounds, a quarter of a million pounds is bullshit. You can't do business that way. And you know, with the high net worth, literally went in one meeting, you know, liked the look of my face, and, and, and wrote us a check. And, and I don't know that it necessarily has to be like that either. But you know, somewhere, somewhere in the middle. The the, the other thing is when, so I, I I I did private equity, and I think that a lot of VC treats early stage investment as if it were a late stage private equity deal. And the way they try to, they look at a company like mine, and they try to value it by looking at my pipeline or 
actually not even my pipeline, right? Looking at my customer base plus the stuff that I have contracted and uninstalled yet, saying that's the revenue and maybe putting a two times multiple on that and there you go, there's your valuation. And I just don't think that it's appropriate to value a company where the upside is very, very high but what they've already done. I think that you have to assume that you're going to get an outsized return by taking risk on what they're going to do. Um, and when you value uh, a, you know, an early stage VC as just a discount cash flow of what they've already achieved, you're going to get to a very low valuation that nobody's going to be incentivized by. I, I, I don't know how they did it for you, but... Yeah, pretty much the way. Good. Please join us in thanking these amazing panelists. So, unfortunately, we have come to an end. <laughs> so, this is the closing of the 11th Annual Global Energy Summit. It was a great pleasure to have you all here. And we hope you had a great time. I would like to thank our speakers who took the time from their very, very, very busy schedules, I guess, to come here and make this conference possible. I would especially like to thank our platinum sponsor, the Boston Consulting Group, our silver sponsors, FMC Technologies and Statoil, and our luncheon sponsor, sponsor Slumberger Business Consulting. At the same time, I want to thank our media partners, Bloomberg, Bloomberg, British Institute of Energy Economics, and Interfax Global Energy. From the outset, what we tried to do this year is to actually build the biggest global energy summit that has ever been promoted. And the credit, the credit for this goes to our exceptional team, mainly, who made it possible through their hard work and dedicated running up. Our speakers team, with Tiago, Bilal, Jonathan, Paul Serve, reached out to our speakers and helped to form the panels. Our awesome, awesome marketing duo, Amrita and Amrata, made the entire marketing and media outreach possible. Our sponsorship, sponsorship team, Efrat, Prem, and Lucy, ensured we have sufficient funds to execute the huge event, as well as our treasurer, who actually kept us in line with the costs. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank our logistics heroes, Rich, James, Barack, and Jimmy. They all ensured that the entire conference infrastructure and venue was more than perfect, I would say. It was a pleasure to work with my friend and co-chairman, Kaustav, as well. I possibly could not have asked for a better co-chairman. I would like now to close the 11th Global Annual Energy Summit. I hope you all enjoyed it. We will now break for evening reception drinks. I know that everybody waits to drink something. Uh, at the atrium, the drinks are sponsored by the Boston Consulting Group. Thank you very much for coming. It was really a pleasure to actually host you here today. <laughs>